So, uh, Professor Bill Mitch is eminent scholar and director of the Everglades Wetlands Research Park. He's also the professor of uh, environmental science, wetland science, at Florida Gulf Coast University in Naples in Florida. Uh, Bill gained his first degree from the University of Notre Dame, or Notre Dame as we all call it, and uh, did a master's and a PhD after that at the University of Florida with none other than H.T. Oden. Before moving on to his current position at FGCU, he taught as Distinguished Professor of Environmental Science at the Ohio State University for 26 years. Bill has over 700 publications, and five of those uh, include five editions of his classic textbook, the number one textbook in wetland science called, predictably, Wetlands. So this really is the man who wrote the book on wetlands. Now, Bill has received countless awards over the years, but a real highlight of that time was uh, his award in 2004 of the Stockholm Water Prize from King Carl Gustaf of Sweden, often referred to as the Nobel Prize for Water Science. On top of that, he's also received accolades such as the Einstein Professorship of the Chinese Academy of Sciences and uh, the much coveted Lifetime Achievement Award of the Society of Wetland Scientists. Bill has received no less than four Fulbright Awards from the US government over the years and the latest of these he's decided to spend with us here in Bangor as part of his sabbatical. So it really is a great honour and a privilege to introduce to you Professor Bill Mitch. Bill. Yes, yeah, testing, okay. Um, I'll stand out here if I can, uh, but thank you so much, Chris, for the uh, welcome, and uh, thank you all for allowing me to talk about carbon. I guess that's the theme of this whole series, but also, I'll, of course, I'll be talking about wetlands, and the, where the two cross is a very interesting part of the research that I've done over the last 10 or 15 years. So I'm talking about how wetlands uh, processes affect the global carbon cycle and climate change. But you're going to see that it affects a lot more. Um, well, I don't, I'll go through this stuff very quickly because you guys all know the, the manifest of climate change is the mostly shown by this graph that came from Mauna Loa in Hawaii since 1958 and really attest to the importance of long-term data sets. And, let's see if the, and when I started using this graph in classes, I won't tell you how old it was. Oh, it was right there. We were 330 uh, parts per million. Of, and I was warning my students then, do you see this curve? And I had a very short curve. I said, this is significant. Uh, this increases in CO2. And sure enough, I've been following it ever since. And it's hasn't slowed down. Um, last couple years look like this. You have this seasonal oscillation due to the metabolism of the planet. And uh, very recently, a couple years ago, we passed sort of an interesting number I thought would never see in my lifetime, 400 parts per million. And it just keeps on going. So that's a continuing saga. That, that's not going to be slowed down in our lifetimes. Uh, even if we cut down the fossil fuel emissions. Uh, the annual uh, temperature, you've, you've heard that is the major issue. It used to be, this whole phenomenon used to be called global warming. And we are indeed in a situation where temperature is rising rather dramatically. And that will come into play on several things that I'm going to talk about. Temperature is everything to biology in this planet. And, and if you increase the temperature, you're going to change a lot of things. Um, so those are the norms, and you can see we keep going above those. And then the sea level rise is a phenomenon, of course, which is also related to uh, uh, 
the uh, planet warming. And you can see in the, the recent history, and there are a lot of graphics that go well beyond this. And I, I'm a person who wants to just say, okay, what do we really know now? And we know right now that it's increasing at about, uh, sea level is increasing at about three uh, centimeters per decade. And could it be six and nine and a 10, as a lot of people suggest? Absolutely, it could be, but it's not right now. And then uh, when you start increasing the temperature of the planet, then all sorts of other things are happening. This was, by the way, this article was just published um, in a geoscience journal a couple weeks ago. And they suggest, I mean, this has been thought about a lot, but this particular paper really delved into this subject and suggested that uh, the frequency of ex extreme storms may increase by as much as 60% if the predicted uh, warming of, of occurs by the end of the century. If you're talking about increasing 60% of violent storms, we're talking about an absolute climate change. Um, so that was just published in Geophysical Research Letters uh, a couple weeks ago. And then, just to show you, first of all, one of the areas where I'm very much involved in right now that's ancillary to this, but it's really not, because when you heat a planet, all sorts of things happen that you hadn't thought about. And one of them is our landscape and waterscape changes that are occurring because of the increased temperature, or supposedly by the increased temperature. And one of them is the eutrophication of the planet, if I can call it that. The fact that now, more than ever, we seem to have, and it's not just seem to have, we do have gigantic blooms of harmful algal blooms uh, all over the planet. This graphic from the World Research Institute suggested there were 750 major uh, such occurrences in the world. I think it's more like 7,500. Uh, everywhere there's a body of water and receiving any kind of nutrients, it's just getting worse and worse. And I'm sure you have examples in, in the UK and elsewhere. One of the I'm going to just show you some examples of projects I'm working on with nutrients and then I'll get back to carbon. But I want you to understand the nutrient cycles are being affected drastically by the increase in temperature and all related issues related to climate change. So Lake Erie is one of the Laurentian Great Lakes and this is Ohio right here where I taught for 26 years. And Lake, the Great Lakes are usually, most of them are quite uh, oligotrophic, very clean lakes. One of the most unbelievable uh, uh, amount of fresh water, clean fresh water on the planet, except for the western basin of Lake Erie. And it was just in 2011, I, I mean, I was in Ohio for a long time and we didn't, we thought we had cleaned up the lake, or at least a lot of people thought they had cleaned up the lake because they put tertiary treatment on the domestic wastewater treatment plants. And they said, great, we're done, the lake's gonna be cleaned. And then in 2011, I remember it, it was like a gigantic green explosion I could hear all the way down to Columbus, Ohio, where Lake Erie, and this is an actual photograph, aerial photograph of, of what happened in 2011, um, in September 3rd, a photograph, in fact, of just explosion of, of cyanobacteria in the Western Basin. And it's occurred now every year since then. So once it got started, uh, it didn't stop. And so every year, the state of Ohio and Michigan and so on are wondering, what can we do? What can we do to solve this problem? And it just hit them in the face, I'm saying, what, 11 to eight, eight or nine years ago. Uh, before that, everybody was complacent and thought the Great Lakes were in great shape. Um, and, and by the way, in this graphic, I suggest that even the state of Ohio suggested this is an affecting an $11 billion tourist industry. So it's not a trivial uh, thing that's happening in, in Ohio. Then uh, down in Florida where I am, and I'm just going to tell you the story of yet another series of algal explosions that are probably due to temperature. In 2016, uh, we had a strange thing happen uh, down in southwest Florida. And this is not a parking lot, ladies and gentlemen. This is, an, this is discharge from a lake that's situated in the middle of Florida, south middle, called Lake Okeechobee. It's one of the bigger freshwater lakes in our country. Very shallow, very eutrophic, and receiving runoff from farms and everywhere else. And when they, they had the discharge, and I'll give the story here, a gigantic flow of water 
to that system into our oceans on the Gulf Coast and on the Atlantic side. And I'll explain why. But this is what it looked like. It looked like a gigantic oil spill coming down the river and going into the blue ocean of the Gulf of Mexico. And Sanibel Island, which is shown on the right, some of the richest people, I almost said Republicans, but maybe they're Democrats, uh, in, in the USA lived there. And they were so, so angry that they, uh, they told the Republican governor, you better clean this up or, we're not, or, or you're toast. Um, and so what was going on was an unseasonable amount of precipitation occurred in January of 2016. This is usually our dry season. This is why people come to Florida in January, February, March, because it's dry. It's beautiful blue sky every day, as you can see by the blue sky here. But what had happened was we had had about 30 centimeters of precipitation in January, which is one unheard of. And, and it was probably due to an El Nino effect. The El Nino Southern Oscillation uh, probably caused this excessive amount of uh, precipitation from fronts and left everybody surprised. So they had to discharge, and I'll explain why in a second, a gigantic amount of water. It was th we calculated it was 3.1 billion cubic meters of water. Fresh water was discharged, I say left and right, but east and west from this lake, rather than allowing it to go north to south into the Everglades, which is its normal course, uh, because there was so much water. Severely polluting both estuaries. And uh, this, this color alone, regardless of what's in the water, the color alone just shocked people. And there are all sorts of environmental groups that began when this happened. People were flying into Fort Myers, where I live, in the city. The airport's very close by, and they were looking out the window and recording what they saw and what they, uh, with the videos from taken from this window of an airplane. And nobody, this was shocking to, to the people down there. And it also happened in what we call season. All the rich Americans from the East Coast were down there. This usually happened in summer and nobody cared, but this happened when they were all down there. So the pumping of this water was due, deemed necessary because of high and unsafe Lake Okeechobee, sorry, that's the name of the, uh, this big lake, water levels, which were in turn due to the high rainfall events 2016. They had to pump the water for safety reasons. And boy, did this set off an amazing backlash towards the government that suggested they really didn't know what they were doing. Then fi about five months later, uh, not surprisingly, I'm back in Ohio and I started hearing about harmful algal blooms in those same waterways. And they were declared to be guacamole thick. And to this day, I don't eat guacamole anymore. <laughs> it was just pathetic, blue-green algal blooms, okay? And uh, th the governor, who didn't know about such things very much, uh, was required to do, uh, to, to uh, call a state of emergencies on both coastlines, on the Atlantic side and on the uh, Gulf of Mexico side. And then, if that wasn't bad enough, we, we had a hurricane in 2017. By the way, if you want to clean up algal blooms, just have a hurricane. So, so maybe these two will counteract each other in climate change. Uh, we'll have algal blooms like crazy, but we'll have hurricanes like crazy too to clean it up. I don't think anybody buys that idea in Florida. <laughs> but in 2018, we had this horrible algal bloom in the coastal waters. We had blue-green algae in the, in, in the rivers and the freshwater systems like always. And then, and I was being interviewed all the time in the local newspapers and so on, that all of a sudden, about the end of July and the end of August, we started hearing about red tide. I don't know if you've heard about this, and I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about it, but that's what red tide looks like when it's in a sampler and we're out in the middle of it. You can almost see the color of the water dip being different on the horizon than it is where we are. And that was early August. And by the way, on the August 8th trip I went out there, CNN went with us. And CNN was looking for a big story. You know, and they heard that we were doing a little bit of isotope work, which I'm not enough time to talk to you about, uh, to, to figure out, well, where's Where's this coming from? And they, they were looking for, they said they're looking for a smoking gun. They were looking for us to identify an industry or a cause of red tide. Well, that's ridiculous to think about doing that with a little study with isotopes, but uh, nevertheless, that's the story that broke red tide wide open to 
if not the entire nation, because it was a big national story. I think it was actually international at that time. And if you remember seeing that article or something, the, the little guy with the green shirt on in the boat taken from their drone was me. Um, and by the way, the, the smoking gun they were looking for was to nail industrial sugar, which we call big, big sugar down in Florida. Okay, so once again, August 2018, the governor, who's probably wondering what's going on in his state, had to declare two different uh, uh, states of emergency. Now, one, to keep the people in the freshwater happy, he had a state of emergency for blue-green algae. And number two, now he had a state of emergency for the coastal system, which requires very salt water, by the way, uh, or salty conditions for the red tide salt water harmful algal blooms. So it's been a busy time in Florida. And what, the reason I'm showing that is because I absolutely link this increase in algal blooms around the planet to, uh, you know, I'm a modeler. We used to do mo mo ecological modeling of, of phytoplankton all the time in lakes and rivers and so on. And absolutely one of the important variables uh, that you had to know to predict algal blooms was temperature. Temperature is gigantic. Sunlight, temperature, nutrients, you get algae blooms. Okay, so now I'm going to go back to wetlands and eventually end up in carbon again. So just a little bit of background on the world's wetlands because this is important. And this is important that uh, everybody realize how tough it's going to be to protect the world's, how tough it's been historically to protect the world's wetlands and how much tougher with the given politics that we have around the world of protecting them even further. I'm very worried about the world's wetlands. This is a map that I have in my book that shows the extent of wetlands. And, and as you can see, and I'm sure I missed somebody's favorite spot. Every time I show this, somebody says, you didn't put my dot up on the map. But you can see the boreal zone, of course, is where a lot of the wetlands are. And, uh, and there's also a significant amount in the tropics and where you find the least, or where most of the wetland scientists are, which is in the temperate zone. But uh, this is a graphic that uh, Lerner and Dahl published of, uh, several years ago of the aerial coverage with latitude and you can see a big pulse of uh, wetlands up here in the boreal zone uh, well 60 to 50 to 45 uh, uh, degrees above north then you have a relatively low number of, uh, of wetlands in, in, the, in the 30s and 20s and then another peak if you will in the tropics and that's a very important point I want to make the tropics do have a lot of wetlands. And it's very hard to estimate how many wetlands there are in the world. These are some of the estimates that have been around for a while. Uh, I would say the last one listed there, Lerner and Dow, because they did the very detailed study of about 8 to 10 million square kilometers of wetlands in the world. And that's about 7 to 9 percent of the world's land are wetlands. So a relatively small portion of our landscape are wetlands, and yet they have an enormous part to play, especially in the carbon cycle, and that's why I'm talking about it. Uh, and then the loss rates are pretty extravagant. We've always known that in the United States, not including Alaska, and they always say not including Alaska, uh, because there's so many wetlands in Alaska, but if you don't count Alaska, we've lost 53% of our wetlands. And that's slowed down dr drastically since we enacted laws to protect wetlands in the United States. It hasn't stopped, but it's slowed down. Um, then Canada, different parts of Canada have very high loss rates, but Canada as a whole, as a whole country, it, it's, it still has enormous reserves of wetlands. Uh, Australia had, in different regions had high numbers. New Zealand uh, published an article, or published a paper, and I think it's supposed to be lined up with the 90. Uh, but New Zealand published a, a publication many years ago and said they basically lost 90% of their wetlands. The place was cleaned of wetlands. China reports anywhere from 30 to 60%. And the only number, I've only found one, a couple of numbers on Europe, and it usually ranges anywhere from 60 to 80%. How it was calculated, I don't quite know. But anyhow, these are big numbers. We lose wetlands wherever we have humans, wherever we have agriculture, industrial agriculture especially, and where we have big urban areas. And that's serious enough, but I want to share with you some three studies that I found in, in the last uh, 
oh, I don't know, three or four years that just were shocking. When each, each one came out, I was shocked more than the last one. The first one was about four years ago. Rusi et al. from uh, Economics of Ecosystem and Biodiversity Study suggested that the world lost half of its wetlands in the 20th century alone. When I read that, I thought, that, no, this is no way. This is impossible. That's crazy. And then I started thinking about it. You know, it might be right, because the world is now losing rates. At the, at the USA and some of the European areas, we've slowed down the loss of wetlands. But there are a lot of places that are just ravaging wetlands in the 20th century. So it could be that we've lost about half our wetlands in the 20th century. That's a, that's a terrible statistic, but it's probably true. Then uh, Davidson published a meta-analysis and found that the world lost 53% of its wetlands long term with higher rates inland versus coastal. And then this is the one that just like, whoa, shocked me. And I don't know how they, their methods were, to be honest. But they claim that in the last 300 years, again, who was measuring it 300 years ago, I don't know, uh, that the world lost 87% of its wetlands total. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a lot of carbon to leave uh, exposed. Uh, and no wonder we're in trouble. So. Uh, I'm just telling you this because this has to play with if we're going to actually not use wetlands but recognize the, their importance, we've got to start protecting them like crazy. Uh, just think of them as a smokestack of greenhouse gases, but also think of them alternately as a great reservoir of stored carbon that we want stored in the earth forever. We don't want to ever release it. So. Um, what do what they have to do with the climate change? Well, I'm going to go, the, the, the easy topic is to think about wetlands as sort of protection systems around our landscape, especially in coastal areas. So down in Florida and down in, in the tropics and so on, we are very happy with our mangrove systems, which have a lot of structure, uh, and they protect us. And, you know, we just had a hurricane, Hurricane Irma, come straight over my lab, straight over my home in uh, Florida and, and uh, last year, two, well, 2017. And thank God we had, we had saved the, the mangroves south of the city. Thank God. And thank God people recognized, starting about 10 or 15 years ago, that they're so important to protect those wetlands. And so the mangroves always take the, the hit, the first hit on, uh, on tidal surges and things like that. And, uh, and even the vegetation from a Spartina marsh, for example, shown here, will secure the sediments to a certain degree. So you got this whole coastline protection. Um, I worked with my PhD student, uh, Dara Mawa, on a paper. We did a big review of uh, the effects of uh, or coastal protection from tsunamis and cyclones provided by mangrove wetlands. And it was extraordinary, the number of studies that have suggested this, but it's equally extraordinary that nobody, we, we can't run an experiment, ladies and gentlemen, to prove this. You know, what are we going to do? Have one Earth with a hurricane and one without? It's, it's very difficult. So you have to use case studies, and it very clearly shows that places that saved their wetlands are the places that uh, had less damage than those places that didn't. But the world's carbon cycle is what I'm really focusing my talk on. Wetlands, of course, provide one of the best natural environments for sequestration. I'm going to use that word a lot now. Sequestration and long-term storage of carbon. That's what they do. That's what wetlands, that's their purpose in, in, the, in the grand scheme of things, is to store, store carbon and not let it out. And yet, they're also natural sources of greenhouse gases. And that's the paradox we have, is the, the positive and the negative in the climate change story. But both of these processes occur for exactly the same reasons, because of the anaerobic conditions caused by shallow water and the saturated soil. So methane emissions result from that, and carbon uh, sequestration occurs because of those anaerobic conditions as well. Well, uh, Bloom et al. published in Science a few years ago a paper where they suggested that about 50 to 60 percent of methane emissions in the world actually were coming from the tropics. This was an assessment of wetlands and our counter, uh, our domestic variety of wetland called uh, rice paddies, and suggested that a significant amount of methane was coming from these systems. 
And you notice it says 227 teragrams, and I'm going to help you guys out with my graphics that come up later. I'm going to try to suggest that you should be able to, in a chemistry class or in a PhD exam, if a professor says, how many petagrams of carbon is that? You can immediately come up with 0.17 petagrams. Is that OK with everybody? Anybody understand what we just did? And the reason I'm doing it is because I got petagrams in all my rest of my graphics. So it's the same thing. Um, so here we're back to grams of carbon. and I or, uh, grams of carbon but per meter square per year. So now I'm back down to a little meter square project uh, scale. And this is a paper that we published in Landscape Ecology in 2013. It, 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 caused, it caused a little bit of excitement. Um, people said, you, you can't do that, and why not? And so we, we have this uh, debate with some of the other uh, climate change people about this. But what we tried to do was go to the literature, and we went only to peer-reviewed literature or or stuff that we'd done that had been peer reviewed, and we're able to at least divide the world into the three categories boreal peatlands, subtropical, tropical, and, and temperate. And as you can see, the, the net carbon retention in these three systems differ enormously. Uh, the lowest carbon retention, I'm sorry to tell you, is the boreal regions because it's so damn cold here. You know, things just don't happen very quickly. It's a very slow process. You would all agree with that, right? You go to the tropics and it's just the other extreme. It's enormously fast rate productivity systems. And then the estimated area, though, in the boreal region, is about three and a half million uh, square kilometers. Temperate or tropical zone, we were found numbers of about 2.9, so not that far lower. And temperate zone, as I told you earlier, that's where the least number of wetlands are and the most number of wetland scientists. So if you multiply the numbers together, you get the carbon retention in petagrams. Now, petagram, did I put it on here? Petagram is 10 to the 15 grams, OK? That's, that's a world number. And when you add them all up, I come to 0.83 petagrams per year of carbon accumulation retention in wetlands in the world. Now, let me put this in a global scale, because this is what really we were trying to do. And that's a much higher number than anybody else had ever suggested. And it's in the book, so it must be right. Huh? Um, and uh, so this graphic is from uh, the Mitch and Gosling 2015, the latest edition. And again, the fluxes are in petagram per year, 10 to the 15th. But the first point to make is the storage of carbon in the, in the planet. Enormous percentage of the storage of carbon in the planet, in the peatlands, in the soils in general, compared to the storage uh, in non-wetland is, is incredible. It's, it's perhaps as high as, uh, uh, well, 30% uh, is what I've heard. It could be higher of the carbon stored in all the world's soils are, are in peatlands and, uh, and, and wetlands in general. So storage is gigantic, and that's something we don't want to let any of that out to the atmosphere. It's, it's a storage we've got to protect. But we, and, and by the way, this is a study done, uh, let's see, from my last textbook, came out in 2015, so it was probably data from 2014. If somebody can help me, a carbon freak that knows all this stuff, not carbon freak, carbon specialist, um, <laughs> of how many petagrams come from fossil fuel burning, but at the time it was 10. And I was shocked because the previous edition of my book, it was six. And probably if I go back to my first book, it was three or something. So it's been accelerating every edition of my book. So it was 10 at the time, and I would guess it's 12 or 13 right now as well, of petagrams of carbon coming from the burning of fossil fuels. So that, of course, goes into the atmosphere. And uh, then, then we're, you notice I specifically are, am emphasizing wetlands in my graphic. And from wetlands and rice paddies collectively, there is my calculation of 0.17, ladies and gentlemen. This, and I didn't even see Bloom's study until after I did that. We're, we had an identical number, so write it down, take it to the, and, uh, and you can see about 0.1 petagrams is carbon and methane coming from wetlands, and about 0.07 is carbon from rice paddies, in other words, domestic waste. 
So that gives us a pretty solid number, I'd say. Uh, but then you notice carbon sequestration. If I add that 0.17 to 0.83, I get 1.00, three significant figures. Now, I didn't put it here, of course, um, of carbon, a gross amount of carbon sequestered by wetlands in the world. I mean, other studies don't even bother putting wetlands on, the, on this diagram, and I'm saying it is about 40% of the total accumulation of carbon in the oceans. So that's one of my first points I'm going to make with you. Wetlands are much more important than anybody gives them credit for, for sequestering carbon. And yet, what do the IPCC police worry about all the time? Oh, methane comes from wetlands, Bill. You better drain them all. It, it really is a myopic view, in my view. I mean, wetlands better be protected. Uh, and we'll talk about that balance between methane and carbon sequestration. It's an enormously important question. So we had this model that we published in that paper. It's a very simple model. If you can see that we have a wetland, we have gross production, respiration, uh, soil respiration, and then F. This is the carbon sequestration that's accumulated in the soil. And, where's the, and this is the release of carbon into uh, CH4 or methane, which of course converts to CO2. And that's the important, very important point that we emphasized in our paper. So we ran these dynamic models, and this is what got everybody all excited, because that's a dynamic system. And so we said, well, let's just uh, run from year zero. It's a horse race. I say all these wetlands are starting at the horse, and we get, shoot the gun, and they all run off at their metabolic rates, if you will. And if the, and this is uh, grams of CO2 equivalent per meter squared, and if the numbers above are above zero, that means that that wetland in this horse race is causing climate change, is warming the planet. If the number goes below zero, it means that they're cooling the planet. Does that make sense to everybody? It's the net, the net of the two. And they all go below zero eventually. That's because if you're sequestering carbon in a wetland, if it's actually taking carbon out of the atmosphere and building up it in peat, organic soil, whatever you want to call it, in some amount, I hate to use this verb, but I will. The carbon sequestration trumps <laughs> methane emissions. Ooh, I said it. Um, so that was sort of our suggested way of, of suggesting, again, are these, all these wetlands lining up like a horse and, and, and shooting a gun and starting? Of course not. But this was a comparison of this simulation, and this was over 200 years simulation. So, okay, so that's still the balancing thing. We'll talk about that a little bit more as I go on. I'll just give you a little history of what we've been doing in carbon. I only have two slides for this 23 years that I spent at, at the Ohio State University at this wetland research park called the Olentangy River Wetland Research Park. And uh, Chris, you never got to visit this, did you? It was, a, it was the love of my life, and we built everything you see in that picture, including some artificial wetlands right here they were kidney shaped. And boy, did I get a lot of grief about that, because I think you guys know the idea that wetlands are kidneys of the landscape. Now, that's not why they're kidney shaped, but nobody believed me. So these became known as Ohio State University's kidneys, or, or Ohio State's uh, kidney wetlands. They're still there. But a funny thing is happening. When you build a marsh, eventually woody stuff gets in. You have the same phenomenon in peatlands. And the woody stuff wants to get in, and the marsh, uh, the sedges and the grasses try to keep it out, but eventually trees win. So they're becoming forested, and the people can't see the wetland now. There's something about a wetland. If you can't see it, you don't appreciate it. So we're going to have to figure out some way of... I built a tower right here. You see this thing with the, the block O on it for Ohio State University? That was for when we were playing Michigan, but never mind. Um, and. Uh, and then when we do studies at mesocosm scale, that's these little dots here. So we felt you needed something a little bit bigger. And we did countless studies on carbon there, is what my point is. And I had summarized it all in one graph that I published in 2014 after I left, uh, uh, left Ohio. In other words, we were measuring methane emissions, and this is in terms of grams carbon, and that's the graph down here, and we were at about 30 in year 15. 
in grams carbon meter squared per year of methane emissions. And I put this dotted line over here as about 60 because that was our reference site. We had a very similar flow through wetland and it was emitting about 60. So I said, okay, well that's what this little artificial wetland's gonna try to be, like it's big brother. So, you know, it will be asymptotically approaching it and probably not going beyond that. So I was, I felt okay with uh, just showing it as a slow curve up to 60. Now, carbon sequestration, I have no clue, but look at the numbers. In, in, in year, I'm gonna say that was year 10, we estimated that we had sequestered 187 grams carbon per meter square per year, average over the first 10 years. And those are very good numbers because they were taken from actual cores so that we could see the, where we started our starting point. And, and I thought, well, that's good. We'll see what it is at year 15, I think it was. And it was up to an average, an average of 243 grams carbon. So all I could do is put a graph through those two points and say, I don't know where it's going. But it was massively higher than the carbon taken out by, or carbon in the, uh, in the methane emissions. Now, will this come down and go down here or something? Probably will. But I still think that the carbon sequestration is a much more important concept of the two between methane emissions and carbon sequestration. All right, so now I'm hopping down to Florida. There's a little map of Florida if you need it. And we're in the southwest corner. And there are two sites that we've been looking at. One is in an area called Corkscrew Swamp. It's a freshwater swamp. Uh, has, it's one of the most beautiful wetlands on the planet. It's why when I was a student at the University of Florida, this, this Corkscrew Swamp was one of the reasons I, I got the religion quick about wetlands. And then, uh, and then we were also doing some studies down in mangroves, down in Naples Bay, next, which is right next to my lab. Uh, and we've published several studies. I'm just going to feature two that more or less compared the two things, the carbon sequestration and the methane emissions. On the corkscrew swamp uh, side, these are the different, uh, I guess you'd call them ecosystems or habitats or whatever you want to call them, but different types of wetlands that we have in one area. That's why I like that site for my graduate student. And he looked at cypress swamps, he looked at uh, wet prairies and so on. And more water as you go to the right on this diagram. And not surprisingly, he found that uh, carbon sequestration in the deep sloughs that had more duration of flooding, more flooding is th this graphic, and this is the carbon sequestration, that it was generally a relationship between the more water you have, the more carbon sequestration. And of course, that makes sense. Um, and for methane, uh, well, I had this graph in my book, so I put it here, but I really wanted to show you, I, and by the way, I tell my graduate students, if you can get a hyperbolic curve in your thesis anywhere, I'll give you a degree. Because everybody puts lines versus time and they're straight. That's not exciting. If you can put it versus a variable, not, not time. I don't, I don't want anything that's time related, but this is days after an inundation. This was water level, it didn't matter. Something else, because that's the way nature works. Sort of the Goldilocks, not too hot, not too cold, just right, right? So that's, uh, sure enough, my graduate students started publishing papers with uh, these curves in them. But they, but they make some sense because this is flooding and it says if you get too little flooding or too much, uh, you actually, it actually decreases methane emissions and that there's some magic water depth or magic uh, uh, flooding time where you get more methane than, than either extreme. So anyhow, that's, an aside, and, and what we, okay, so this is, that's, that's the uh, freshwater systems, and we do have this methane and carbon sequestration balancing act that we have to do. Now, we also went out and uh, sent some different students out into the mangroves, and we did some studies. Mangroves are a very important ecosystem in southwest Florida, and Florida in general, and certainly in the tropics, they're gigantic. There's 170,000 square kilometers of mangroves in the world, and I think we have an estimated 5,000 square kilometers of mangroves in Florida. Well, this again, down by, very convenient next to my lab. Uh, we had two tidal creeks that we were looking at, and you can see we sampled along both of them for these parameters. This is what one of them looked like. 
And it was so beautiful. A uh, uh, friend of mine who took this picture, I said, can I put that on the front of my book? So the most recent edition of my wetland textbook has this photo on it. Just majestic back in there. And these were the tidal creeks we were using as the places for doing our sampling. And again, this is carbon sequestration done by Daniel Marchio and a bunch of rest of us as co-authors. Uh, carbon sequestration in different types of mangrove systems. But the reference creek, the one that was totally unimpacted by human beings, uh, you know, look, it averaged about 140 to 150 grams of carbon per meter square per year. But the disturbed one, the site had been physically disturbed, fresh water had been cut off, all sorts of hydrologic disturbances, was much less. There was about 90 to 100 grams for carbon per meter squared. So that was one point. But these are still good numbers. These are still high numbers. And let me just take all these and put them together, and I'll explain the rest of the story. So the freshwater systems, you can see the numbers on the right-hand column are carbon sequestration. So they're 100 grams of carbon. That's an easy number to remember, but something that's very typical that you're going to find in a, in a freshwater wetland. The mangroves were about the same, 90 to 140, depending on whether you're disturbed or not. But I want to call your attention to those zeros. Um, I had just hired a postdoc from Germany. He was a Spaniard, actually, and a very good guy. Uh, and um, the project that I'd hired on him hadn't worked out. So I, he arrived, and I said, you're going to study methane in mangroves. And he was smart, smart enough to say, there's no methane in mangroves. I said, you're going to study it and find out there's no methane in mangroves. We, that has to be published. So we went out and took samples three or four times when he was down there over a year's period. And he was so despondent. He says, I still haven't found any methane. I say, that's good. And we had a hell of a time of publishing that, by the way. You can't publish zeros very easily. But there was no methane. And that's just almost a truism. And for those of you who study, uh, methane emissions from wetlands, saltwater systems usually don't have very much methane at all because the, the sulfur cycle competes with the carbon cycle, basically. So we published it, even though it had zeros. It took three or four years to get it published. Uh, so that was, that's, 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 by the way, called blue carbon. That's why there's a lot of people very strongly calling for restoration of mangroves because it's called blue carbon, because it doesn't have the methane aftertaste, if you will. And so therefore, it's almost the perfect ecosystem. Here's the problem. They only make up 5% of the wetlands of the world. Basically, our freshwater, our saltwater systems are about 5%, and our, uh, our freshwater systems are 95%. So we have to pay attention to the freshwater systems as well. And it says wet period. Then you notice, just as a reference site, I don't think I have it circled. We did a pine flatwood, which if you're a smart ecologist, you would say, wait a minute, that's not a wetland. It's not. And it's got very small amount of carbon sequestration and almost no methane as well. So this whole methodology we use works very well for finding those two pathways. Oh, there's the pine flatwood. And this is another graphical technique that we use for suggesting whether these are true sinks or sources of uh, of uh, uh, the carbon effect on climate change. In other words, if it's, if it's a sink on the left side, uh, that means it's good for the climate. The climate will be cooler because of that wetland. If it's on the right side, a source, then that means it's not good. And for the most part, if you give it enough time, and that's why the simulation I did was so important, uh, everything comes out clean. And this is a gra uh, graph of mangroves where every data point you can see is on the left-hand side. And it says they're sink because there's no, basically, there's no methane to speak of. Well, to summarize these numbers, because I've given you a lot of numbers perspective-wise, how does, what does this fit in everything? I th they had an article on climate change in 2015 in the local paper. And there's a picture of us taking our sediment cores at Corkscrew. And this quote just basically said, we estimate, you can't read it in the newspaper thing, we estimate that 220,000 US tons of the carbon are sequestered annually from the atmosphere by Florida mangrove wetlands. So for the public, we were putting it in perspective that they could understand. 
and, and another source we found that one car emits essentially two tons of carbon per car per year. Therefore, Florida mangroves carbon sequestration is equal to the emissions of 110,000 cars forever, or a very, very long time, let's say. Now, is that big, is that small? I don't know, but it puts it in a scale that the public can understand. All right, I'll end up with my conclusions real quickly here. Wetlands are among the best systems for long-term sustainable carbon sequestration on the planet. And this includes created restored wetlands. We showed that in our study in Ohio. It doesn't have to be just natural wetlands. You can create wetlands to sequester carbon, and it will last a very long time. Uh, nevertheless, many climate change scientists view wetlands as sources of greenhouse gases and little else. It is shocking to me, and it should be shocking to anybody that works in wetlands, how the wetlands have been manipulated. If you do a word search for the word wetlands in an IPCC report, you're lucky if you find the word sequestration next to it always about the greenhouse gases, and that's unfair. We have lost major storages of carbon in the biosphere with a loss of 60 to 80 percent of the world's wetlands. I mean, it's enormous what we've lost are. And with warming temperatures, we will lose even more stored carbon, resulting in positive feedback. So if we do nothing and we warm the planet, we're still going to be losing even more wetland carbon to the atmosphere. So that's a, the uh, positive uh, feedback that everybody's claimed is, is eventual, if not occurring now. Because most wetlands are CO2 sinks, the role in emitting methane gases such as, well, methane gases, <laughs> it should be greenhouse gases, such as methane, is less consequential. I didn't say it's unimportant. I said it's less consequential because methane decays in the atmosphere and CO2 does not. There's a basic chemistry 101 principle that's very important. Methane gets in the atmosphere, it decays to CO2. CO2 gets in the atmosphere, it just stays there until some plant takes it out. So it's a very, very different phenomenon. Coastal wetlands, salt marshes and mangroves, uh, while representing less than 5% of the world's wetlands, are better poised than inland forest shorter wetlands as net sinks or radiative forcing. Blue carbon. Those oceanographers were very clever to grab that term, and they tenaciously hang on to it. Um, and uh, again, it is a wonderful idea. Uh, you're not going to save the planet with, the, with only 5% of the world's wetlands. Many models that generalize wetland ecosystems or wetland communities into single categories may be missing the carbon fluxes by orders of magnitude. A lot of people will just have wetlands and put a carbon sequestration or a methane emission number, and they're vastly different depending on where they are. And the, finally, let me get back to jump ahead. The Ramsar Convention on Wetlands, and I hope you understand that organization. Uh, it's a very important international agreement to protect wetlands. And other international conservation organizations need to provide an even stronger message in the world's climate change discussion on the benefits of wetland for mitigating climate change. I see Ramsar. I'm, I'm, an, I'm a member of Ramsar. I follow them closely. They're only now starting on uh, World Wetland. Anybody know when World Wetland Day is? in this whole audience. We've got a bunch of wetland people. What? On a Wednesday. You don't know? On a Wednesday. Yeah. On a Wednesday. <laughs> Maybe it was last week. It's February 2nd. Yes, you know that, right? Well, anyhow, we should all be celebrating that day if we're doing, studying peatlands or wetlands. For goodness sake, that's our, that's our holiday. Um, and I've noticed now in the last couple of years with the Ramsar Convention, they're sending out posters, they're sending out flyers, and they're starting to suggest, it's just, they just caught on last year, that holy cow, these wetlands are important in the carbon cycle. So they finally got the message, and I hope they continue to pound on that, because that's a very important point. So that's basically my recommendations. Uh, thank you. Thousands of, well, at least hundreds, not thousands, but hundreds of graduate students and, and uh, visiting scholars and colleagues. And uh, Chris, you could have been in this picture easily. It just so happened I took it on a day when we had a few visiting scientists. Um, you know, everybody contributes in the lab. That's why I run my lab. And uh, so a lot of the people that are I've cited and some people who are in this picture very much are helping us do carbon and nutrient studies. Those are our are two big areas we're doing research now.
And of course, if you want to buy the book, see the cover on the front? It's the mangroves in southwest Florida. Uh, and we're up to volume five, which published in 2015. So you're welcome to check out what they're charging on Amazon for that. Uh, and thank you very much. <laughs>